Greetings and salutations. I'm America's R&B historian, Tyrone Dubois. And my friends, you're watching the one, the only, The Cindy Davis Show. Cindy Davis Evans of The Cindy Davis Show. Thank you for tuning in. I want to give a shout out to Mr. Andre Pittman of Enthlone Records. My guest today gained popularity in the 70s and 80s with the popular music group Switch with his hit songs like They'll Never Be, I Want to Be Closer, and I'll Call Your Name. He has worked with Quincy Jones, Lionel Richie, and Barbara Streisand. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Phil Ingram. Hey there, welcome, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm jamming, what about you? I'm great, great, thank you. It's an honor to have you today. Well, it's nice to meet you. Now, where are you from before we yeah, get started? I'm gonna I'm I'm interview from... you before you interview me. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I'm from Houston. You are from Ohio. Akron, Ohio, yes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been, can I ask you a personal question? Of course. Have you, have you ever been mistaken for, uh, Dominican descent or anything like that? I've always, I mean, all my life growing up, uh, people always thought I was either from India or uh, from, um, not Dominican Republic, but um, I want to say not Ecuador, um, Ethiopian. Ethio oh, okay. Yeah, okay. those are the two I've gotten, Ethiopian and, but Indian from, from a little boy, you know what I mean? Really? So, yeah, but it's funny because I'm the darkest and if there's six of us, I'm sure you're going to ask all that, but it's six of us. And, um, you know, uh -huh. James, my brother, you can see he was light skinned. Yeah. But, yeah. I was the darker one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When I, when I saw the album cover for the first time, I'm like, oh, I think he might be from Dominican or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my People have always wondered where I'm from. Then it's like, then they hear me talk or sing, they're like, no. No, nah, oh, that's a brother. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Being the little brother of James Ingram, did you ever feel as though you had to live up to his success? Not at all. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's six of us. <clears throat> mm -hmm. James was in the middle, and I'm the youngest, and him and I were six years apart. Mm -hmm. um, here's what's funny, though, because Switch made it big before James made it as a solo artist. Okay. Oh, no, it was never like that. So here's what happened. The reason I got uh interested in the music industry when i was eight years old mm -hmm. james was 14 he got into his very first band you ready for this cindy mm -hmm. sharpie okay. and the g clefs <laughs> sharpie and the g clefs that was the name of the band so Sharp energy sharpie and the g clefs oh okay so you know that was a long time ago <laughs> but he used to take me on the rehearsals i was like oh man i was loving it. i was like i don't know mm -hmm. how i'm gonna do this but i'm gonna do this and so yeah. then you know James uh, was playing keyboards and got another band called Revelation Funk. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and Howard Hewitt is also from Akron. And Howard was in this band called Life. And then when James was coming to California, he was 20 years old. I was 14. And I'm getting now into my first band, which was a band called Raw Soul. Okay. And so, you know, so James, you know, he'd come back and visit and stuff. So he's out here out in California hustling. And uh, next thing you know, um switch got together december of 76 greg williams and jody sims came out to california um you may have heard the story where they ran into jermaine jackson in the motown building and gave him a cassette tape yes yeah, hit cassette <laughs> and so anyway that's how we got the interest in the motown so now this is march of uh of 1977 so i'm calling james i'm like Hey man, I'm coming to California. Yeah. He said, for what? <laughs> I'm like, I said, we got a record deal. And he was wow. like, Negro, what do you mean you got a record deal? <laughs> like, in other words, I'm back in Akron. When he left, I'm just now getting my first band. I yeah. said, James, I said, Jermaine Jackson heard our tape and 
He said, are you serious? I said, James, yes, I'm coming to come to uh, California. He said, well, man, that's cool. So yeah. so then, you know, switch it. Then, of course, with our first album, it went platinum and everything. So, no, James was very proud. So, no, I, I never had to live in his shadow at all. Yeah. Uh, oh, I understand. And as a matter of fact, back in the days when they would ask me about interviews and stuff, like who was my inspiration to the music industry? I actually said my brother James, but nobody knew who he was. Oh. But then when he got with Quincy, um, because James had sang three demos just once. Remember that song called, um, They're Never Gonna Give You Up, Gonna Hold You In My Arms Forever, by Sergio yeah. Mendez. James did the demo for that. Same writers, Barry Mann and Cynthia Wilde, and another song called Here and Now that was recorded. Um, and um, anyway, they got sent to Quincy Jones, and Quincy loved the song just once and, and the singer. Yeah. But then when I was doing these interviews and stuff, I was like, my brother's actually going to come out now. You know, the one I've been talking about for years. So it, he would actually, when Just Once came out, which was 1981, yeah. you know, Swish had already had their foot in the door, had, you know, about four albums out at the time and everything. So. Oh, wow. So he was walking in your shadows. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We've, all, all we've, always been, we've always been proud of each other. And absolutely. Him and I did a lot of stuff like behind the scenes. I mean, we sang on so many records together. We've done commercials yeah. together. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, I just want to say uh, my condolences to you personally. Oh, thank you. To you for the passing of your brother, James. Yeah. What happened? He was having, he was having some health issues. Mm -hmm. The last time him and I performed together was 2011. Um, out here in California, Quincy did this thing called 60 Years of Quincy Jones. Yeah. But it's in 1982 when they did that dude tour. I actually did that tour with them singing background. Oh, really? So, yeah, it was a lot of us that actually got together and oh, did okay. the um, some of the same ones, you know, that did that. So anyway, we, Hollywood Bowl was a great show. And that was the last time we worked together. But then, you know, James and I would keep in touch and stuff. And then um, it's about 2015. I'm like, like, OK, I can see some memory loss when I'm talking to him. I'm like, you know, let's say because I also work with Sheena Easton and uh -huh. I'm like, hey man, I just got back from blah, blah, blah. I see, said, yeah, I just got back. And you go, Debbie, uh, what we just come back from? I was like, ooh. So I knew something was wrong. So I called my older sister, my sister Joyce. I said, have you noticed some memory loss for James? And she was like, yeah. I said, oh, okay. Because my mom had Alzheimer's. And so he was the oh. first one. And then um, honestly, by 2017, we couldn't even hold a conversation any longer. So he had early onset Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. He had stopped performing in 2015. So then after that, so, I mean, we knew, you know, him and I uh, actually lost another brother one month before James, mm -hmm. the one that was uh, next to me. And then my brother James uh, in 2019. So oh, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Well, thank you. But yeah, they both had health issues. Yeah. And so it's four of us left. And so, mm -hmm. and so, you know, if I'm the youngest, then the oldest one is in the 70s. So. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. So I just, um, let's kind of go back a little bit. Uh, you sung a little bit with Tower of Power. Is that correct? Uh, no, I actually never worked with him. No, um, not with Tower of Power. No, I love Tower of Power. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that you bring them up, though, because um, when I had left, there was a point where I had left Switch. And, you know, I was doing, I was doing so much stuff, working on a bunch of films and doing mm -hmm. a bunch of guest vocals and things. Mm -hmm. and commercials and radio station IDs. And so, uh, and I was just kind of done with groups. And, um, but I got asked to become the lead singer of Tower Power. And I, I called them, I mean, when they called me, I said, if this had been, you know, another time in my life. Yeah. But I was, I was just, I was done with groups. So when we switched, got back together, you know, I told Greg, I said, as long as, you know, cause you, um, you may have seen the unsung episode of Switch. And then some of the, the issues that happened with, you know, Bobby and them. And so uh, Bobby DeBarge and them. And I was just kind of like, OK. So now, you know, we just we're um, four originals. We're back together and doing stuff and, you know, performing and just having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Not all those other issues. You know what I mean? <laughs> so but no, I never I never worked. But I love Tower Power. Oh, OK. OK. Um, so speaking of unsung, were you happy with. Uh, with the feature they did with Switch? Yeah, you know, like it, uh, like anything, um, they, they're they going to always leave out certain things. Because, I mean, just my interview alone, I, I mean, I did probably 
a few hours of a shoot. And then when they, I even got called back and did some more. So, really? and you, yeah, when you're talking about that, what, 45, 50 minute show. Mm -hmm. So I knew certain things were going to be um, cut out. And so, uh, but yeah, I mean, since it was us telling our own story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it was, I mean, you know, the commentator is going to make some comments. That's, that's okay. But uh, since we were telling our own story, yeah, we were happy with, you know, because it was us saying what we had to say, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so what and was one thing, the, go ahead. What were some of the things uh, they left out that you may have wanted them to uh, feature? Well, see, I knew because, uh, you know, Bobby's, um, you know, his life and everything, since Bobby mm -hmm. and I were the main lead singers, even though all of us sang, you know, doing yeah. four-part harmony and everything, um, it was a couple of times, because they, you know, they said, if we ever ask you a question that, you know, you don't want to answer, just let us know. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm fine, because if I don't want to answer it, you know, <laughs> you, answer you, it. you ain't got to worry, yeah. <laughs> so, but it was a couple of times where they were asking me something about Bobby. Um, okay. And I'm like, and Bob, you know, Bobby was a phenomenal talent. I mean, I loved working with him, but yeah. you know, he had these other issues that made it a challenge. And so um, they asked one way and I said, I said, you guys already did a, uh, how did I say it? I said, you guys already did an episode on DeBarge. So I said, you know, the family dynamics, it hasn't changed. That's yeah. how I answered it. And then I was asked again, almost a similar way. And then I brought that up again. Okay. The third time they brought it up, trying to say something about Bobby. I said, I said, Bobby is no different than like an Elvis Presley, a, a David Ruffin. I mean, some great talent that had some drug issues and had some other issues that he was dealing with. So I, I kind of minimized it because, you know what I mean? I didn't want them to just focus on. But what we were not happy with, which we had nothing to do with, is when they did that Bobby DeBard story, which was a joke. Ah. Uh. None of us was consulted on that at all. We didn't even know. I mean, Greg knew, but I had no idea it was even happening. I'm like, this is really? Like, yeah, this, this is really bad. Wow. So that that was, yeah. But as far as the unsung episode, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it was them asking us, you know, our history, and we told it like it was. Yeah, so, well, well, since I have one, um, you want to clarify a few things. Like, um, okay, like where, where did they get their name? Switch. Switch? Oh, yeah. And, and that was that was accurate. We talked about that in the, uh, okay. in the episode. What happened was <clears throat> when Jermaine, like I said, he's the one that got us, um, got the interest in Motown. At the time, Jermaine Jackson was married to Hazel Gordy, which was Barry Gordy's daughter. Mm -hmm. And so when we came out, he actually heard us and he was like, he was just blown away. He was like, man, you guys are better than the tape that, you know, that we had. Yeah. And so, uh, he came back and we were rehearsing at this place called Studio Instrument Rentals. They call it SIR out here. And by the third or fourth day, he said, you guys got the deal. And we're like, are you kidding me? And he's like, no, you got the deal. He was, they were blown away. But we still had to do our showcase. So when we did our showcase, you know, it was like Barry Gordy was there, Suzanne DePass. You know, I mean, some of these legends and some songwriters and stuff, you know, they were, we were going to be the newest thing at Motown. Yeah. Um, we actually all play multiple instruments so here's let's say i was out front singing a song mm -hmm. bobby debarge would be on the uh on the keyboards and then if when bobby went out to sing a song i was on the keyboards and greg and greg and eddie would be on the horns eddie plays trombone and trumpet and greg plays trumpet i mean mm -hmm. and then if bobby and i went out to do a duet like we yeah. we performed i want to be with you at our uh showcase mm -hmm. and then greg and we get on the keyboards and then we did the song that's on our first album called Somebody's Watching You that Jody sang. Bobby got on the drums. Long story short, we were just doing what we normally do. Uh -huh. We had a meeting with Motown. I mean, they were blown away. And Suzanne DePaz says, I've never seen so much switching in my life. <laughs> uh, and we were like, you know, being silly. Let's call the band Switch. And, you know, just as a joke. But then um, uh -huh. when they got to think about it, I said, that makes sense. Yeah. Is that your quote to say that? What? Let's call the band switch. Yeah, because you know, I'm I was one of the jokesters. I'm like, said I was 18 years old being silly. Yeah, uh, but it stuck. Oh, yeah. Well, when they <laughs> talked about it, they said it makes sense because that's who you are. You guys can play multiple instruments. You guys can you sound like a singing group. It was like yeah. it was so unique. And um, 
even to this day, we've known, you know, certain band members where one, one or two people might play multiple, like Prince, you know, he was a solo artist, but he played That's guitar, cool. keyboards, you know, sang, mm -hmm. lead, background, all of that. And um, it was unique to have more than one person in a band that did that. That's why Suzanne that, DeFast said that. That's, that's multi-talent talent there. So how many instruments do you play? Well, I started, started on the drums when I was, was, when I was little. Okay. And because we had a piano in the house, um, yeah. my oldest brother was phenomenal. We were like, his ear was just like, he'd hear someone on the radio and come home and play it. And then um, James was playing the guitar and then started picking up the piano. So I started picking up the piano. And then I was 16 years old, signed Family Stone, they were out. And, um, you know, Larry with all that thumping, you know what I mean? Mm. Well, let me be myself. That, that we like, I was like, oh, man, I got to play the bass. So I went to a pawn shop and, the <laughs> and bought a bass and put on record. I'm, well, because I play by ear. And so, mm -hmm. so mainly I play, you know, percussion and drums and keyboards and, um, and the bass guitar. I never picked up the regular guitar. But what happened when I was 14 years old and I was in my first band, um, this keyboard player named George Anderson, he said, Philip, do you know you can sing? I'm like, oh, yeah, I mean, I sing around the house. He said, no, 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 no. I mean, you need to come from behind those congos. I joined him as a percussionist. So singing has become my main thing. And then I would say keyboards a second now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, yeah. then uh, percussions and basses. That's what's happened. But so now it's singing, keyboards a second, you know, then drums and percussion is third and then bass is, is last so so yeah and uh, speaking of singing how many um titles did you lead or co-lead oh quite a bit um because if you if you uh here's what's interesting uh, you know motown kind of had a, a thing for trying to push one person out mm -hmm. you know like you think about First, it was the Supremes and became yeah. Diana Ross, the Supremes, the Miracles, Smoking. You know what I mean? Um, if you listen to a bunch of Switch records, I actually do more leads than Bobby did. But Really? Yeah, like on our first album, we had- What songs were they? Huh? What songs were they? Well, on our first album, we had that song called I Want to Be With You. Bobby and I sang that together. That was actually supposed to be our first single. But then They'll Never Be was another one. And- um. Bobby sang that one. And then the next one on that, I'm just looking at side one, was I Want to Be Closer, which was Bobby and I, and that became our, our second hit on our first album. Right. Then, if you listen, if you flip it over, like on side two, because uh, Somebody's Watching You was on the first, no, We Like to Party. That was kind of like a group thing. Yeah. We had a song called Fever, but you pulled a switch. I'm singing pretty much that. And then Bobby has a couple of lines. Then I, I did this song called It's So Real. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so on every album, like, you know, um, you'll hear those those Philip Ingram fans that were, you know, part of Switch, we'd be doing our shows and, are you are you guys still going to do Call On Me? Are you guys going to do Without You In My Life? Those are the ones that I sang by myself, you know, that type of thing. So. Yeah, so I want to be closer. Can you sing, a, can you sing a couple of bars of that while I have you here before I are, forget? Are you asking me, can I, or you ask me, will I? Because really? can I means, are you able to, honey? Uh, <laughs> well, I know that you are able to, but are you willing to? Sure, Cindy, for you, many days have gone by. I say to myself, gotta let her know she's mine. Then Bobby, ooh, ain't gonna waste no more time wishing you were mine. If it's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna walk right up to you, babe. Bravo! Wow. <laughs> oh, girl. Hey, I had to get that out of the word before I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> you, what, you know what's cool though, and this is is really a compliment because, like I said, we got together in 1976. So now you're talking about 45 years. Yeah. And the one thing we did this thing called At Home with Switch, and we did I Want to Be Closer, and um. Yeah one of the newer songs that we were doing, but it was the, the comments that we got back that was, you know, people was like, man, you guys still sound phenomenal. And I would, I would tease them. It's like, you know, kind of like you get older, you still got it. I'm like, well, honey, if I give it away, I can't work. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. we hear, we hear that a lot when we do our shows, they're just like, wow. 
because they're not expecting us to still sound like we sound. Matter of fact, we got what's called the mm -hmm. Hal Award from a Motown Heroes and Legends Award. And, um, you know, Barry hadn't, you know, because we haven't been with Motown since 1982. And we have this guy named Akili Nixon that you saw in Unsung that, you know, you know, Bobby was, um, he died in 1995. Yeah. So Akili has been like the closest we could find. And uh, even Barry, we, we performed at the Hell Awards. We were getting a Hell Award. And he was like, he said, wow. He says, I'm pleasantly surprised because, you know, he, he had no idea that we were, first of all, still doing what we were doing. Because, you know, we're not really recording, but performing and stuff. And then to sound as great as we were still sounding. He was like, wow. wow. Yeah. Because wow. again, you know, he was focused on Bobby as opposed to Switch. Because yeah. if, if you think about, we, we talked about um, the way Earth, Wind and Fire was marketed. Mm -hmm. You had, you know, duets with uh, Philip and Maurice, and, but you had Maurice by himself. You know what I mean? And you had Philip by himself. Yeah. And then you can see that, because I mean, we like when we were getting a platinum album, Earth, Wind Fire was getting multi-platinum albums. You know what I mean? What did you get the we, platinum album for? Oh, the, the first album. Oh, okay. Actually, okay. the first two, really. Yeah. So, wow. and then our, you, you know. nominated? Were you nominated for a Grammy? We were never nominated for a Grammy, no. Wow, yeah. With all that success, you would think you would be nominated for a Grammy. Yeah, but yeah, James was. As a matter of fact, uh, on the Dude album, um, mm -hmm. that album was nominated for 12 Grammys. That's how big that album was. And he was nominated for three out of the 12 and won one. Um, okay. You know, so just out the box, he got, he was able to get a Grammy. Like, you go ahead, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How, what was it like working, working with Motown? Actually, it was a, we, we learned a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and we, we got to work with some great people. Um, you know, Barry Gordy, he's a, this, this is how cool it was at when we first got signed. He was so into us that when, we had meetings at Motown. Um, we would meet with like, you know, Suzanne DePass or mm -hmm. Tony Jones or Lee Young. But um, when Barry wanted to meet with us, he yeah. was meet with us at his home. Wow. So, yeah, he would have us come up there and it was like, wow, that's when we knew this is really going to happen. Wow. And you probably saw an unsung. So like when we did our first album, you could tell it was still a group. And, um, you know, we're starting to have some success. And I'm like, I mean, I'm happy. It's like, yeah, I mean, Okay, you know, we made our mark, but it's like, yeah. like I said, these other bands were killing. You know, by that time, yeah, Commodores were doing multi-platinum albums, you know what I mean? And we were on the same label. So we do our second album, mm -hmm. and, you know, um, I Call Your Name becomes like the big hit. So now you got these two big albums. So it's yeah. like, okay. And and then they started, uh, you know, they, you, you, you probably heard the expression, the worst thing about it, success is a little bit. You ever heard that expression? Yeah, yeah. Oh. There's no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're having a little bit of success. And so then after a while, yeah. Harry Gordy's home, we're working on a third album. And it was um, there's a song called Power to Dance that's on a it's on a third album. And um, I was thinking it was to open the, the record, but it didn't. But anyway, here's what Barry Gordy said. We talked about this on Unsung. Now imagine, Cindy, we're sitting at Barry Gordy's home. Mm -hmm. He's helped groom, I mean, come on, the Jackson Five, the Miracles, the Temptations, you know. Absolutely. So it's um, like, mm -hmm. so we're sitting in there. And so, and again, you have to admit, he helped create who Bobby had become because mm -hmm. he had been giving him this leeway. So mm -hmm. he says, Power to Dance is a number one record. I love the energy. I love the melody. But the lyrics need to be changed. Yeah. Why wouldn't, he, why wouldn't Bobby change the lyrics? And that's what Bobby said. He said, I think the lyrics are fine. I remember I was 20 years old and I said, are you kidding me? Because that's what I'm saying. When we did our first album, mm. it, was, it was a group. By the time we got to that third album, he mm. felt like it was him. Oh, okay. It was like, wow. uh, no, my blood. So... Did you have any idea what he wanted to change the lyrics to? No, it's just what he was, what Barry was saying was the lyrics aren't as strong as the melody and the music. That's okay. what he was saying. Right. He was just trying to give you that, you know. Yeah. Let's, hit, like, in words, let's bring this up to the par of this yeah. music and this melody. Because, mm -hmm. you know, 
great. It is a great melody. I mean, we uh, yeah. we actually open up our show with that. I just want to tell you. I just want to tell. I mean, it's you know, had a nice groove and everything. So it's like change the lyric to match the melody and you know. And you guys got it. He said you guys have a number one record. Wow. Wow. Guess what? That was the last time we was at his home. Oh no. Wow. Oh, so, wow. That's what I'm saying. So by this time, he was out of control, but mm. did Barry help um, with that? Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know if you know this, a lot of people didn't catch this on Unsung. When we got together, um, Bobby was not with the group because Bobby at the time was dealing with some drug issues. We had this guy named Arnie Haynes and Arnie was a, uh, you know, falsetto and he played keyboards, same type of thing, you know, different look. Tommy did, was, he lead, did he lead any songs? No, here's what happened. We did, um, when we did our demo, mm -hmm. it was me and Arnie. So when Motown got the interest, remember the cassette I talked about? Yeah. That they heard me and Arnie. Bobby wasn't a part of that at all. So we already had oh. this interest in Motown from wow. the cassette that Jermaine heard, heard without Bobby DeBarge. Wow. So let's talk about this on Unsung. But Arnie, for some reason, and to this day, Cindy, I have no idea why, he decided not to come. And we're like, are you kidding me? We have this deal pending with Motown. You're not coming? And so, Greg, what? I know, honey. Some people, let me, I'm, I'm going to be nice. So anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Greg called us up because Greg and Jody were out in California. You know, I was still in Akron. Tommy was actually uh, in Akron with me at the time. And Eddie Flew Ellen, he was in Akron. And so he said, hey, guys, Arnie's not coming. We're like, are you kidding me? And we had already talked to Jermaine on the telephone and everything. He said, what do you guys think about Bobby? And he said, he's straight. He's clean. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I said, well, talent wise, absolutely. But I mean, if, you know, they said, no, he's and he's willing to give it a go. So we were like, based on that, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's why when he we came out, um, they actually ended up flying Bobby out. He we arrived on a Monday. He arrived on a Tuesday, mm -hmm. and then we got together and he actually played us "I Want to Be with You" because mm -hmm. he had wrote that and he played us "They'll Never Be," and we put our showcase together with a couple of those songs and songs we already had. Mm -hmm. That's you know that's when we got to deal with. So again, he started to think like because you know, like our first. Um, single was supposed to be I Want to Be With You, yeah. but then they pushed They'll Never Be. Great song. And so it's, it's about Bobby. So then when I Want to Be Closer, you know, that was okay, him and I. But then on our second album, um, they went with Best Beat in Town, which we were surprised. We thought they were going to go with Fallen because uh -huh. Best Beat in Town was like a group thing, you know. Best, yeah. Yeah, you know, just nice little groove song. Oh, yeah, that was a nice one. I like that one. Yeah, but see, when we were, we were up at Barry's house, guy now I think his name was Dan Ellis he had been brought over from CBS he said the song I think is going to take switch into this uh pop genre he's he mentioned uh calling on the girls mm -hmm. that was a duet that Bobby and I did and we were doing Soul Train we were practicing Best Beat in Town and Calling on the Girls mm -hmm. three days before we did it was like our third time on Soul Train they said um, we need you to change Calling All the Girls to I'll Call Your Name. That's going to be the next single. And I was like, hmm, okay. So I'm like, I knew, from then on, I knew which song was going to be like the single, like on the, on our third album, um, yeah. I'll Always Keep was a great song that Jermaine Jackson wrote. And uh, Bobby and I did this song called My Friend in the Sky that was like still one of my favorite Switch records. Yeah. And I said, but I bet you... Um, don't take my love away is going to be the single and that was our single it didn't make a lot of noise because you know, by that yeah. time Motown had pulled back like I said oh wow and we come back with another top 10 hit with love over and over again on our fourth album but we lost some momentum from that you know I think the lyrics are fine I'm like wow wow man what <laughs> Yeah, you know, some people just can't handle success, you know. You're right, and, yeah, and, and, and they are afraid of success, you know. But exactly, they are. How did you handle success? What did you do with your first big check? And how did you <laughs> handle success? <laughs> Honestly, you see who you see who you're talking to, and uh, who I am right now. Yeah, honestly, if you'd have met me 
doing the switch, hey day, I'm the same. Wow. And, uh, and you know why? I had great parents that kept us grounded. Yeah. Uh, oh. I was doing this one uh, interview with a uh, member Chocolate from Graham Central Station. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She uh, she has an internet show and she called me up one day because her and I used to do a lot of sessions and she was like, she said, um, you know, she had me as a guest, you know, like this. Yeah. And so she said, Philip, when when Switch, you know, they hit big. Like, did you like wig out? Because she's known me for years. I said, girl, uh, no. I said, I'd go home. My parents were proud of me, but my father would be like, Philip, take out the trash. <laughs> <laughs> Can you shovel some stuff? I'm serious. Yeah. So when we came home, it was like, you know, I'm proud of you, but you know what I mean? So we never. Uh, got the big head. Oh, no. And you know what? As a matter of fact, it's funny. I was. Um, I guess the best way I can explain this, I used to play basketball at this park, you know, not too far from us. Mm -hmm. And people knew me from playing basketball and they knew we were signed, but, you know, we didn't have a hit yet. So when They'll Never Be came out, you know, first they introduced me like, oh, this Philip Ingram, let's say hi. And then, we, you know, we picked three on three or whatever, or four court and we're playing ball. So when, after They'll Never Be came out, then people would start to introduce me like, oh man, you know, this is Philip Ingram Switch. And I'd be like, no, 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 no. I'm the same Philip Ingram that, you yeah. mean? So, and I was Philip Ingram before Switch. Uh -huh. so the thing yeah. that happened with me, I didn't let the music industry define me. I was already defined. That's why I was able to come into the music industry. Oh. What kept you grounded? I know your parents kept you, uh, kept y'all grounded. Because, Was you know, there anything else while you were out there? You know how they say 15 minutes of fame? Yeah. Okay. I wanted more than 15 minutes. I wanted longevity. And whether it was, wow. it, whether it was hits over wow. decades, mm -hmm. and I knew enough to know that how many has crossed decades? You know, you got Michael Jackson, you got Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder. You can count them. You know what I mean? Yeah. That they had hits for decades. Quincy is one of them. Yes. James probably crossed two decades. But, uh, you know, we had about a good five-year run and would have had more, yeah. but it didn't happen. So... What did I do? I started doing, um, I mean, it's funny. I've done more outside of Switch than I ever did with Switch. I'm just most known for the things I've done with Switch. Yeah, tell Switch, me about the things that people may not know that you've done, Oh, but has not been publicized. Funny. Uh, well, no, a lot of them have. I've done a bunch of guest vocals with, um, you, you, like you heard of Jeff Lorber, keyboard player. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I had a guest vocal on his record. I've had... I literally sang so many guest vocals. I probably have enough guest vocals out there that I it probably could be seriously about two or three albums. Wow. But wow. commercials, um, sang on a bunch of commercials, been on a lot of films. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, I was I was the wedding singer in my best friend's wedding singing, say a little prayer for you. Oh so, my goodness. I yeah. love that song. Yeah, so you'll see me there. That was We shot that in 96. But here's the one, I don't care how old you are. I don't mm -hmm. care what race you are. When I tell people I sang on three songs on The Little Mermaid, they're like, oh, are you kidding me? What so, songs did you sing? They look at you. Look at you. <laughs> you became a little girl. <laughs> <laughs> so when the movie opens up, that mysterious fathoms below, sang on that, I sang background on uh, Under the Sea. Under the Sea, oh. under the sea. But oh, okay. the girl, now here's, I learned something. That, we shot this in uh, 1984, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, we're singing, why don't you kiss the girl, right? We're doing that. And there's a little animal, yeah, 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 all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So then, so then I learned something, Cindy. This is this, this is funny. What they is would it? be like, uh, so, Philip, can you do some ad libs? And I was like, wait a minute, you want me to do some ad libs on this cartoon? I learned a lot, though, because it was four <laughs> of us, right? And then I learned that, okay, four is like a group setting. If you sing some ad libs, even though it's not a full solo, mm -hmm. it becomes a step out for you know movie uh, um, jurisdiction. I was like, so I learned that. So I'm like, so at first that was my first one. Like, really? They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay. So if you listen to Kiss the Girl, so you you um, you start hearing this. It goes, why don't you kiss? And you hear, go on and kiss the girl, go on and kiss the girl. You hear all these little sofa ad libs coming up underneath. Wow cartoon that's me that's so awesome i love it i'm gonna have to check that out i know i know it's it, like i said it's been a whole bunch of stuff 
Matter of fact, you remember the movie uh, uh, Father the Bride 2? Yeah. Okay, we, there's a scene where, you know, they're selling the house. Mm -hmm. And um, he has his daughter with him. And they say, remember, and they show this collage of her growing up as a little girl. And it's in slow motion. Yeah, and yeah. It's a song called Remembering Annie with no lyrics. Mm -hmm. That's me doing all those vocals. All the, I'm doing all the, it's just me and strings. Oh, okay. I'm just oh. going. Do, 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 do. You are such a talent. You are, no. <laughs> no, but I'm just telling you. So you asked me what kept me grounded. I'm like, yeah. Switch, I love you, but I'm like, Phil Bingham was going to keep, you know what I mean? Keep longevity. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it going. And that's, yeah, that's what I've been able to do. Literally uh, from 18, I'm now 62. So you talking, what? Oh, wow. What? Phil, can you tell me what you think you would be doing had you not chosen, chosen entertainment? Is there, do you think is there anything else you may have been doing? Honestly, um, I didn't know what to do. I only did, I did a little bit of college because um, um, you know, I graduated in uh, June of 76. And then uh, Switch got together December 76. But my parents would always press education. So I went to Akron University from September through December. And um, the only thing I can think of, I'm like, you know, to get close to it, maybe I can do something like, like a disc jockey or something, but I'm like, I knew I wouldn't be happy with that. But oh, okay. so when Greg talked to me, see, I don't know if you guys know this. Let me back up. I forgot about this. Greg and Bobby and Jody was in a band called TNT Flashers. We heard about them in Ohio, part of them from Michigan, part of them from Ohio. Mm -hmm. And then they came to California and actually got a record deal. Barry White heard them and signed them to uh, RCA Records. Mm -hmm. and changed their name from TNT Flashes to White Heat. So I had their album. I was like, because we knew that some of these guys was from Ohio. Yeah, oh, yeah. They ended up moving back to, they came to Akron, kind of like a base. So, you know, some were from Akron, and I mean, some were from Ohio, and some were from, uh, from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, kind of like close where they can go back to family. That's how I met them when I was 16 years old. Like I said, the little band I was in, and mm -hmm. we became friends and then um, by that time, Tommy DeBarge was also part of White Heat. And, you know, we became friends. So Greg basically felt that White Heat had accomplished everything they could. And so that's when he approached me. And it was like October 76 about putting this group together. He wanted a group with, you know, guys that could. I mean, this was all Greg's vision. They could play multiple instruments that they can sing. And he said he wanted them to look good. And so that was how he he put us all together and uh, he literally handpicked everybody. And then um, that's how Switch became in December 76. But yeah. I knew then I'm like, OK, they had a record deal on RCA Records, so they know something about getting a record deal. Yeah. So we had faith in that. And yeah, that's what happened. Oh, so, yeah. Tell me about uh, are there any funny or embarrassing moments that really stick out to <laughs> you over your career? <laughs> Maybe on tour or anything like that. I think we got a bunch of them, but here's our classic. Matter of fact, okay. Greg, Greg wrote a book called um, "Switch Motown." De, no, "Switch to Barge Motown and Me," and um, it's, <laughs> oh yeah, and it's it's doing really well. But <laughs> okay, so we we're signed to Motown now. You know, we're like and then us, Rick James, and um, Tina Marie, and High Energy. We all got signed around the same time. And me and Tina were really good friends and stuff, you know. So um, <laughs> so anyway, we're on the elevator. This is a classic. We call them debargisms, right? <laughs> okay. They say you need to write a book about that one, debargisms. No, Greg got it in his book. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. This was a classic debargism where you're just like, okay, man, if you don't know the right thing to say, don't say it. <laughs> so we get on this elevator, Suzanne DePass, remember, you know, gorgeous lady. And she smelled really nice. Then just say, Cindy, wow, you smell really nice. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Honey, so Bobby said, Suzanne, that's a nice fragment you're wearing. Fragment. No, fragment. Oh, fragment. M-E-N-T. Instead of fragrance. That's a nice fragment you're wearing. I lost it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. What was her response? Oh, we just all started laughing like, oh, she laughed. Bobby, okay. Bobby, it's fragrance. Just say she smelled nice. I mean, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, yeah. This one was uh, wasn't embarrassing for us, but it was pre-American Idol. It was embarrassing for this this girl, and um, we had a meeting with Motown. I I have no idea who she is, so I hope. Well, anyway, I have no idea who she is, but we were all coming down together, here we go, you know, back to our homes, and we were all together. This girl said, "Switch, switch! Are you kidding me?" So she was excited. We're like, "Yeah, you know, we were nice," and asked, "Could she take a picture and stuff?" And it's like, "Sure." So she took a picture, and then. She said, well, you know, I sing too. And we were like, okay, but we didn't ask her to sing. And so, <laughs> I'm sorry. So she starts singing, If I Was Your Woman. And it was so bad. She was like, if I was your woman. <laughs> Tommy lost it. And I felt bad. Tommy started laughing. And I was like, come on, man. And so it hurt her feelings. And then she got up. Oh. I know, and it's like, and I was like, honey, well, I'm sorry, we didn't ask you to sing. And then she was like, <laughs> and she's like, well, you guys don't look like your pictures anyway. <laughs> and I said, well, how did you know who we were? And it made the whole band laugh. And I, <laughs> like, so anyway, yeah. Oh, my goodness. We had a lot of moments, trust me. But those what, about, just, what about on stage? On stage, actually. Um, Any embarrassing moments? Have you ever not really, because years? we, you know, we, Honey, if we forgot a lyric, we would just add live in a heartbeat. And the audience, because you, you know. I don't even know the difference. <laughs> plus, when you, yeah, when you're a, you know how it is when you got these huge hits and people are seeing you, it's almost, you can do no wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so seriously, if, we, yeah. if I got a lyric and I started ad living, yeah. they would know. The yeah. only thing that got weird to me was one time, you know, because the girls were like, um, they were so into Switch. And one time we, we were doing I Want to Be Closer. And I was standing like close to the stage and I'm always, you know, I'll be singing and this girl pulled my microphone cord and I almost tipped over. No, and I was like, Woo. And I said, wait, wait, wait a minute. I mean, that was one time I said, I actually stopped singing because I, I saw myself falling over to the crowd. So yeah. after that, I'm like, okay, let me give myself a little space. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. pull the cord, I can just fall on the ground or something. So, but, oh, but no, we yeah. actually had no embarrassing moments. We were, yeah. you know, like, let's say I'm a, a um, if a keyboard or something went out, you know what I mean? Yeah. Then you would have uh, somebody else, like a, a tech would come and, you know, take care of that while somebody got on another keyboard or something. Because mm -hmm. we had four keyboard setups because I had my own plus my congos. You know what I mean? Greg had his, Eddie had, and Bobby had his. And then, so everything was always covered. Yeah. Matter, matter of fact, you, That's uh, amazing. you remember Gerald Albright? You ever heard of him? Saxophone player? Yeah. Phenomenal. Um, he has a bunch of albums out. Gerald was our sax, a lot of people don't know that. He was our sax player live on stage uh, before he was this big solo artist. But uh, yeah, he got his, he cut his teeth with us when we were in our heyday. Very proud of what he's done awesome. and become. Wow, so are you all still touring? Were you touring before the pandemic? Yes, we, uh, what happened is, like I said, I left the group in um, 82 and at the time, and I, <clears throat> I mentioned this on Unsung, the reason I left the group, because even though I loved Bobby and Tommy, I was just, I was tired. I mean, it's like, you know, we're sitting here, we got this great thing going. And it's like, you know, Bobby, I'm not going to change some lyrics. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, come on, man. And then there was times on stage, I mean, times when we were touring where he didn't want to go on stage. And I was like, oh, I just, God. you know, I love him, but I'm done. Yeah. And so when uh, Motown Let Us Go was in 1982, and we were having a band meeting and by this time Bobby was gone, you know, and DeBarge, his brothers were just starting to fall into their own. All this love wasn't out yet. They had, um, they had done an album that kind of shelved because Switch was still hot. But then when all this love came out, you know, L sounded a lot like, you know, Bobby and they called themselves DeBarge with, you know, family name. So that name was known. And so they, I mean, and rightly so, because yeah. I mean, that family was super talented. But anyway, we had a band meeting and one of the members mentioned about getting Bobby and Tommy back and going to another uh, to another record company. I'm like, are you guys kidding me? Mm -hmm. Like, that, I mean, that's the whole reason that we, in the predicament we're in. And yeah. I said, I said, I love y'all, but I can't do it. Uh -huh. And you remember you asked me about, you know, getting wigged out? Yeah. I believed enough in Philip that um, as much as I love him, they were the reason I was out in California. I knew mm -hmm. I could do things on my own. And so, and that was right at the time when James just once had come out and the Dude album and, you know, 100 Ways, and that was happening. So I left the group, and um, James and I had done, and Phil Perry, we had done some sessions with Quincy 
mm -hmm. with Quincy Jones, um, just singing background. And so Quincy asked James to put like the background singers together, you know, for the dude tour. And he asked me what I'd like to do. And I was like, I'd love to. So wow. it was me, James, I'm sorry, it was me and Phil Perry and a girl named Edie Lehman. Mm -hmm. Ended up becoming like a, she was a soap opera star. I think, uh, I forgot what, Young and Restless, no? Anyway, but mm -hmm. her and I done a lot of sessions together. Yeah. And so then, you know, when, when Patty was singing, um, like let's say Razzmatazz, you know, James would be singing background and when James would be singing 100 Ways, Patty would. So you always had, you know, either three or four of us doing backgrounds. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I did that whole dude tour. And then after that, I was signed to Quest Records for just a little bit with me and another guy named Zane Giles. We called mm -hmm. ourselves Deco and did, um, did an album. You know, it didn't do well. But, mm -hmm. but the point I'm making was I was still doing, doing stuff. Switch at that time, they got signed to uh, Total Experience Records with Lonnie Simmons. Yeah. And they had a semi-hit called Am I Still Your Boyfriend? But it wasn't, you know, was, Bobby was gone, I was gone, Tommy was gone. But it was Greg, Eddie, and Jody, and then there was three other guys. So then after that, we didn't get back together until um, we tried once in the mid-90s, but still yeah. wasn't right. Yeah. But in 2003, remember Tom Joyner? Oh, yeah. Tom Joyner and uh, Frankie Crocker, they were some of the ones that broke our first record. And yeah. Tom Joyner got a hold of Greg and said, would you guys be willing to do the, uh, what was those things he would call, um, would you have? Us. No, oh. it, it was a live thing on the radio. I forgot what they called them. Oh, I remember that. Five, you had to be there at 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, something like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, fly job. It, was like, it was like a fly something. Fly right. job. No, it was. But I, you know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. Greg approached me on that. I said, Greg, as long as it's right. I mean, yeah, I'd love to, you know, so that was 2003. And by the time mm -hmm. we had already heard about Akili. And so um, we actually did it with DeBarge, but L wasn't there. And, uh, you know, we did, oh, really? we only had like 25 minutes. So I said, let's just do the top five. You know, let's do yeah. like, I want to be close to They'll Never Be, Best Beat in Town, um, Love Over and Over Again. And what was the other one? Um, Hey, so many though. So we did the, those top five and that's what started it. And from there, a phone call started. Come, so since 2003, we've been back together with, uh, you know, me, Eddie and Greg. Tommy was actually with us at the time, Tommy DeBarge. And then sad to say, Tommy also has health issues. Tommy and I are the same age and um, we couldn't use him. So we had a guy named um, James that was with us for a little bit. And James ended up moving to Indiana. And now we got a guy named Dion Estes, who was actually used to play with Wham, and he was a uh, solo artist in England yeah. years ago. Yeah. And so, and Michael McGlory, who played on, you know, he's the guitar on They'll Never Be on I Call Your Name and all that stuff. Yeah. He was Jermaine's guitar player at the time, but he played on all of our records. So it's like having another original because he's part of that sound. So that's why people, when they hear us, yeah. they say, man, you guys sound the same. So yeah. Absolutely. I'm listening to you singing and it's like the same. Your voice hasn't changed. Well, like I said, girl, if I, give it away, if I give it away, I can't work, right? <laughs> this has just been a wonderful walk down memory lane and, you know. It's you like just, we have a phone conversation, huh? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing, you know. <laughs> You're talking with legends and everything. You know, I love what, I love what I'm doing. And, yeah, yeah uh, me yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Well, keep doing what you're doing. And are you planning on maybe doing another album after this pandemic or a single? But you are still going to be touring, right, after this pandemic? Yeah, actually, we, we had it. Greg, here, let me pull this up. Greg literally sent this this morning. Okay. Um, and this is because uh, we have like a Switch WhatsApp thing. And he, you know, because we, we did this one thing called At Home with Switch, where, you know, we yeah. did a little... Just oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. At home with Switch. I think I saw a little bit of that. Right. We did. I want to be closer. And um, uh -huh. we were off of our homes and stuff. Yeah. But he said, uh, so we're going to be doing some more of those while we're in the pandemic. But he says, okay, there was somebody at home with Switch. They, uh, Melissa, DJ Soul's sister last night, she, she posted at home with Switch on her Quest Loves Instagram pages. And the response was all positive. It says it went through the roof. And so she and her friend fans are now awaiting our next one. And so then he said, um, here he says, I'm also getting 
phone is ringing, inquires and offers a possible in Wisconsin in August, one in Dallas, Texas in November, and a couple more track dates. So, but you know what? It's like Amazing. that happened last year, and then it's like okay, <laughs> push back and you know. Have to push it back, and, yeah, yeah. yeah so we'll just have to wait. Up, I don't get excited because until yeah. this pandemic is over, because like I told you, I also work at Sheen East, and it's the same thing. We've got some shows scheduled at the end of the year, but that happened last year, and then they, you know, they all yeah. start getting canceled. So. Oh yeah, yeah, you know. Oh my goodness. So you've been keeping yourself busy throughout this pandemic, I see. Actually, more so from. I mean, I I, I can do sessions from home because we all have you know, recording stuff in our home. So yeah, oh, amazing stuff here. And, um, I and that's, that. yeah, that's what makes it nice. So, and you know, cause what they do now, they could just send you the files. Like, uh, I just did a thing with a, a girl. Um, her name is, um, Sonia Eddings Brown. Mm -hmm. And for this, you know, something for the Olympics, possibly for the Olympics, but okay. she's in Utah and I'm like, honey, I ain't going to no studio. You know what I mean? So yeah, not right now. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they just send me the music files. I did my mm -hmm. vocals, send them back, and you know what I mean? Oh, okay. Yeah. Amazing the way we can still make music, and we're not even in the same room. Technology, I tell you. Exactly. Well, so, I, I just want to go ahead and just close this real quick. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time, God bless.